This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, I want to talk about invisible power structures. Invisible power structures that control your life, that control the world, that control nations. And they are the control centers, if you will, of mankind or a society within mankind or a nation or a state or a culture and many other things. Many people that you know and I know, and really that's basically what's taught in both public and private school for the most part, they assume that the invisible power structures or that the power structures that exist, they assume that they are the ones that they've been told about. So, for example, in the United States of America, we're told that the power structure Well, we're told that the power structure consists of we the people. That's in um, our Bill of Rights and Constitution, we the people. But to just what degree do we the people, I mean the common people, the regular people, the ordinary people, to, to what degree do we actually control and to what degree do we have the power that it says we should have? I mean, we have the the theoretical power structure, or the the theoretical power structure, which we are told uh, exists. And, you know, people, um, it's interesting, people can be dumbed down to a large degree, but people also have common sense to a large degree, at least some people. So so there's this um, kind of knowing that the power structure that's visible to us is not exactly who controls our society, our government, our world, etc. That's where the term, for example, the shadow government arose. The shadow government, or the deep state. Now, there's always been a shadow government ever since man's governments uh, have come into being. And That's why when we analyze history, you know, you really can't analyze history accurately unless you integrate biblical truth into it. You can't make the analysis. You can't understand, to be blunt, you you cannot understand what's going on all around you. You have no clue. You are among the clueless. If you don't know how to integrate the truth that God has given us in in his word, to um, the reality that we live in and the historical records that are supposedly accurate or whatever. Unless you integrate biblical truth, you are going to be wandering like some kind of nomad through the desert. You're going to have no idea what's going on. So let's, let's, let's just take it right from the beginning because you won't, you won't hear this on a cable news network for the most part, so conservative, moderate, or liberal. And have you noticed, and I've noticed, people I talk to have noticed, it's becoming increasingly obvious that the so-called uh, moderate news network is turning more liberal and more liberal and less moderate every single day. In fact, <clears throat> The people that used to be the guests on the liberal networks are now like hosts or semi-hosts or guest hosts on the moderate news network. And, you know, that drift is intentional. The, 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 The game plan of the drift or the goal of the drift is to make them all the same. I mean, they're practically all the same anyway, but... You, at least you had some kind of uh, some kind of difference. The goal is to get rid of that difference because the people that really own and control the mass media are what we would call the, the shadow government or the deep state. Now that's not a conspiracy theory. That's simply a truth. It's a fact. How do we know it's a fact? It's very simple. Anybody can prove it in 30 seconds. Whenever you have ownership of all of the mainstream media in the hands of three 
globalist corporations. It's guaranteed that since just three globalist corporations owned by the same wealthy globalists through what, what, what is called interlocking directorates, in other words, it looks like there's different globalists controlling the different three corporations that control all of the media, but they pl- play little games. So with interlocking directorates, you can have on the board of directors the same people on the board of directors of one of the three global corporations that control all the media as on the other one. Now, that may not mean a lot to you or your friends or whatever, but when I started out writing books and researching, the number of corporations that owned the media, just just to give you an example, was somewhere like 250. 250 different companies controlled the media in the U.S. 250. So that means you had all kinds of different ownership um, of different media outlets. Now, that, that doesn't guarantee that there was freedom of uh, the press or freedom of information, but it sure did a lot to expedite it. It, it sure did a lot to uh, protect it. So what has been going on behind the scenes, and I remember watching this every, because, you know, I would write a book with a copyright date on it, and in one book, <clears throat> it would be like, Uh, Well, let's say when I started writing books, it was like 165 corporations uh, owned the media. And then uh, a number of years would go by and I would write another book and I would check the uh, number of uh, corporations that owned all the mainstream media and it would be like 75. And then finally, I mean, it stunned me. In the last number of years, it's now just three. Three. Three and the three globalist corporations that own the uh, all the mainstream media are also the three wealthiest globalist families. They're one and the same. So, do you think that they have a hidden agenda in terms of what they want communicated and what they don't want communicated? Of course, they do. They have a hidden agenda. They want what's good for them, not what's good for you. Those are two opposing, two uh, absolutely opposing ideas here. And it should be simple to all of us to understand because it's human nature. They want what's best for them, period. And what's best for them, they're going to do. It's called absolute control. And by the way, our government is supposed to be uh, protecting our freedom of speech. Notice that in both the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, nobody showed up to that party at all. Nobody showed up to the party that is supposed to make sure that we have freedom of the press, because that's the only way you can get true information. So what we really have is the make-believe government and the make-believe media, with notable exceptions. I'll say that Donald Trump is not perfect. Nobody's saying he's perfect. He's certainly not perfect, but one of the ways that you can measure to the degree that Donald Trump is under the control totally of the globalists or not, it's it's really a very simple way to uh, figure it out. What is the level of animosity? What is the level of attack? from the other institutions in America, specifically the media, but all the other institutions. Now, if the other institutions in in America are constantly attacking Trump, well, that's a a good rule of thumb that Trump is not really under the control, uh, the total control of the globalists or the shadow government, or they wouldn't have to attack him so much. The purpose of the constant barrage of attacks against Donald Trump is really for a reason that I don't think most people will quite understand. It appears to be that the purpose of constantly attacking Donald Trump is to impeach him or to remove him from office or whatever. 
And I'm sure that's the goal of a number of people, but I think that they've been smoking way too much uh, Southern California or California legal, legalized or, or uh, Colorado legal, legalized marijuana, because that isn't going to happen. But you see, when you constantly bombard the public with undermining messages, undermining messages against Trump and what he's doing, you're, you are successfully, to whatever degree, to whatever percentage, eroding his support, eroding his confidence level, and eroding the support of his base, and eroding, to whatever degree, the support of the public. You're keeping it, to, to, to be really blunt, you're just keeping him in check. So the purpose, that's why the, the Mueller thing, you know, we're on repeat with that. I couldn't be more bored. Um, they have Mueller up there just to find anything that they can find um, to try to stir up a, a fresh wave of attacks against Trump because it's all about keeping Trump under their thumb. It's all about keeping him from getting too powerful because if he gets too powerful, the shadow government, the people that really control this nation, are not going to like it because they have been busily controlling our nation and government for for uh, well, over 100 years, and, and actually longer than that. So it's to keep Trump under their thumb. And you see, when the media is all behind you, or hardly attacking you at all, that's a good indication that you're saying exactly what the media wants you to say. So that's how the game is played. So, many people in our nation, you know, use the term shadow government, but they don't really understand it. Who is in the shadow government? By the way, in our book, Trumpocalypse, that I wrote with Troy Anderson, the end times president, a battle against the globalist elite, and the countdown to Armageddon. In Trumpocalypse, we explain all of this in detail. In fact, in Trumpocalypse, what's interesting about it, it's been out for, I guess it's been a year. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that uh, it, it reads as if it was published yesterday because all of the information is like critically up to date. And the blueprint that we said they would use against Trump is, in fact, the blueprint they are using against Trump in, in an attempt to destroy him. The tragedy is, is that there's such a uh, disconcerting percentage of Christians and evangelical Christians whose, whose biblical worldview is so shallow that they cannot analyze the situation properly. Their minds are molded and shaped by the media because they don't have minds of their own. And that's why you will hear me constantly talk about this, constantly talk about the need for being self-educated, the need for reading, the, the need for having knowledge. Because you see, the communists understood this when they began their communist revolutions, which began around 1917 with the first communist revolution, which was called the Bolshevik Revolution, which was the communist revolution, also known as the Russian communist revolution. Financed, by the way, and this is a documented fact, it's financed by uh, the international banking families, both in Great Britain and uh, in Wall Street. That's a fact. That's who financed the Communist Revolution. And um, the Communist Revolution was completely paid for by the international bankers because what a lot of people don't understand, because they've been dumbed down systematically, and by the way, in my brand new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, as I've been writing it, um, uh, new data and research came out very, very recently, scientific study. And it is a scientific fact that 
people all over the world, including America, are measurably dumber. They've been dumbed down than they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. In other words, there's been a decline, a scientific, measurable, trackable data that proves that people are dumber now than they were 40 years ago or 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And that didn't come out of a vacuum. That came about by design because it's much easier to to enslave a nation or bring a nation into captivity when you dumb them down first. And the communists understood this because they the people that created communism were very evil. In fact, they are or were Satanists. That's not Paul McGuire's opinion. I have that. I can document that in my new book, uh, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. Karl Marx, who was the co-author of the Communist Manifesto, that's their like ultimate book on how to have a communist revolution, and Engels. Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto. And when you study Karl Marx's life, you find out, it's a, it's a historical fact, that he was a Satanist, he belonged to a Satanic church, and he admitted that, he, and I have his quote in my book, he admitted that he had sold his soul to the devil. You'll never hear that in a secular classroom or a secular textbook, but see, doesn't that shape, <clears throat> um, doesn't that give much more clarity? When people know the truth, they be, that they're set free. So doesn't that give you tremendous clarity and understanding the nature of socialism, Marxism, and communism? When you understand that the people that created it were Satanists? I mean, that, that makes it really, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer that communism, Marxism, and socialism is an antichrist religion. It's an antichrist religion. It's because it's not just a economic philosophy. It's not just a social philosophy. It's not just a philosophy about how to govern a people. It's a religion. You see, that's why you have to have a biblical worldview and not just a Jesus experience. Now, I have to explain that because some people misinterpret what I, what I mean by that. So um, I need to define what I mean by that so, so we're, we're clear and you don't think I'm saying one thing, which I'm not. So I'll say it again. That's why it's important for you and your children and grandchildren to have a biblical worldview and not just a Jesus experience. I don't mean Jesus exp- experience in, in, in a derogatory manner. And I don't mean a Jesus experience as just being synonymous with being born again. Yes, absolutely, it's important for you to have, but it's the most important thing for you to have, a personal supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, in which you're born again. It's absolutely important. It is the most important thing that your soul is saved above anything in our ministry Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church, one of the foundations of our faith is that, above all things, our goal is to win souls to Jesus Christ, which simply means to lead them into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to lead them in a prayer of repentance by helping them understand why they need to repent and leading them into making a personal invitation of Jesus Christ into their lives so that they can be born again by the Spirit of God. They can be new men and women in Jesus Christ because it's only by becoming born again through the Spirit of God that you can have eternal life and enter the kingdom of heaven. So that is the most important thing. Now, you can call that a Jesus experience, but it's more than an experience. It's a truth. Because people have experiences all the time. I mean, 
you can see all these documentary films on Netflix and other places, and people belong to all kinds of Eastern mystical cults and have had Eastern mystical experiences. When I was an atheist and when I was in the New Age movement, I had tons, I shouldn't say tons, that's an exaggeration. I had many, many experiences, supernatural experiences. I saw the great white light, entered altered states of consciousness and all kinds of things, blissful states. But you see, those were experiences, emotional experiences, but they were not the truth. When you accept Christ into your life by faith according to the Word of God and ask Him to forgive you of your sin and ask Him to come into your life and make you born again, you may experience something or you may not experience something. Sooner or later, you will have an experience or experiences. But the basis of you being born again is never built around the level of your emotional experience. It's built around the truthfulness of God's Word. That's so important because we live in a world where, well, let me give you an example. You can all, every one of you can relate to this. The average person that you talk to, including Christians, um, they'll use language like this, talking to people who are in this marital status or premarital status or whatever you want to call it. They'll, they'll say things like, are you in love? Oh, they look like they're in love. Oh, oh, they look like they're really in love. Are you in love with them? Are you in love with her? And on and on and on. Oh, I'm in love. Why do you want to get married? Because I'm in love with them. Why do you want to get married? Because I'm in love with her. And on and on. And, and what do they mean that, by that? I'm in love with him. I'm in love with her. Because that's the basis for their, their decision of whether or not they're going to get married. But what does to be in love mean? Well, what that means in our society is really that heady euphoria that really is an altered state of consciousness. I, forgive me for being so clinical and scientific about it, but... That's what it is. It's an altered state of consciousness. You feel in love. It's all about a feeling. And if a feeling isn't there, you're not in love. And therefore, you're not going to get married. Or you hear these, th this, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, and I continue to hear it, especially tragically in Christian relationships. And it, it shouldn't be that way in Christian relationships. Why are you getting a divorce? Well, I'm not in love with him anymore. Or I'm not in love with her anymore. We fell out of love. You fell out of love? It's like saying, we. let me give you a very bad analogy. I mean, it's really bad, so forgive me up front. It's awful, but it's the only one I can think of. I'm the kind of person that um, I have, uh, there, you know, we all have like inner instincts. But that's an emotion, by the way inner instincts of, of what we should do and what we shouldn't do, and things that are safe for us to do and things that are unsafe for us to do. So, for example, there are certain physical activities when I was a kid or in college that I wouldn't do because I didn't feel safe doing them, even though by nature I was very adventurous and rebellious. And in many areas, I would try anything, but there were exceptions. I never felt comfortable riding on a motorcycle. Okay? Now, that's just me. A lot of people feel comfortable about it. There was just something about a motorcycle that bothered me. And I can tell you exactly what it was. I would look at people riding motorcycles. It looked like a lot of fun. My favorite movie, one of my favorite movies back then, way back then, was Easy Rider with Peter Fonda and Jack Nicholson. You know, they're on a motorcycle. And besides the fact that one gets blown away on the motorcycle, riding these big Harleys looked like, like a lot of fun. So part of me was attracted to riding a motorcycle, but this was the problem I had with it. Back then, they didn't require you to wear motorcycle helmets, so you could, you could ride your motorcycle anywhere and you didn't have to have a helmet on. But I would see everybody I knew who had a motorcycle or motorcycles going down the freeway and stuff. 
and you see a guy, it's usually a guy, but a lot of girls too, and, you know, it's one person, and they're on basically what, like, it's like, uh, forgive me, motorcycle riders, it's like a bicycle, but it's like more intense, heavy, has a powerful engine, bigger tires, etc. But it's like a big, muscular bicycle with a high-powered engine, depending upon what you're riding. Now, the people who are into motorcycles are going to disagree with me, and, 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 and that's fine. I'm just talking about me. I don't, I, I, what I would do is I'd look at the motorcycle rider, and I'd say, and maybe it's because I came from big cities where the traffic was always crazy, and I'd say the only thing between that motorcycle rider and the car in front of it or the car next to it or the car behind it or their body is, is the pavement of the freeway and, and the heavy metal of, of, of the automobiles around it. There's no, there's no cushion. There's nothing to protect your body and brain should you have to come to an abrupt halt or should you smash into something, including the pavement, with your body. There's no barrier. There's no protective barrier between you and that motorcycle and the pavement or whatever. So because of that, I never felt quite safe, and, and, and I really didn't like to explore the idea of riding a motorcycle. So, this guy uh, who's in the, my first year in college, I lived in the dormitory, and then after that I lived in houses and stuff. So, this guy in the dormitory, I'm late for class, and he, he says, look, just jump on the back. And he was going to give me a ride to, to the class so I wouldn't be late in his motorcycle. And I said, you know, I don't know about this. I don't really like motorcycles. He said, get on, get on the back. Don't worry about it. So, you know, he wasn't going all that fast. And we were, we were driving. Uh, he was driving a motorcycle. And we were on a street. Not, again, not going that fast. But there was open construction pits, like, you know, no exaggeration, like 10, 12 feet deep. that were real, real parallel to where I was, which is sitting behind him on a motorcycle. Well, for whatever reason... This is my first time on a motorcycle in a long time. He hits a bump, and I go flying up. And fortunately, I catch myself because I fall off the motorcycle but land on my feet, and I didn't go into the 10-foot or whatever it was pit. But, you know, I said, no thanks, because I'm just not comfortable around being on a motorcycle because there's no protective barrier. And I could have fallen in to the ditch. Now, here's the really bad analogy. I apologize. Falling into the ditch is how a construction ditch ditch that's 10 feet deep is kind of how people talk about falling out of love. It's like we were in love and then we we fell out of love. And I, I apologize, but I think of this falling out off a motorcycle into a construction ditch. How do you fall out of love? I know it's lame. Sorry, I apologize. How do you fall out of love? How do you fall in love? I understand what they're talking about. They're talking about the overwhelming romantic feelings that we call being in love. That's the right person because they fall in love. But what it really is, is it's biochemistry. You get a rush, a, whole, a rush of a whole bunch of powerful biological chemicals in your brain and your system that produce a euphoric high that we call falling in love. And the right triggers will will create that. Somebody's personality, their looks, their sense of humor, and many other things, okay? So, but the point is, you can't base the foundation of your marriage on an emotional high we call love. I mean, even the Bible teaches us that. And that's why the Bible uses three different words for love, because the Greek culture and the New Testament was translated into Greek, and it's from Greek that we get our New Testament translation. The Greek culture um, had words that were more precise when it came to love. So they broke love into three categories. Eros is the first category, category, which is sexual, romantic love. That includes that high euphoric feeling. That's Eros. doesn't have to be necessarily sexual. It can be 
more like ro platonic, romantic, or whatever. But it produces that high, you know, euphoric feeling. That's called eros. And then you have ilio, which is the kind of love that a, a mother has for her son or daughter or father has for his children. Let's just call it, the, or, or a, a best friend uh, in, in, in the sense of uh, a, a non-sexual relationship. And those bonding relationship, especially parent to child, describes that kind of love. And then you have agape love, which is the highest form of love, because it's not based on self, it's not based on a feeling someone gives you. Agape love is the love that Jesus Christ demonstrated to us. Agape love is Christ-like love, because how we characterize agape love is that agape love doesn't seek its own pleasure. It seeks to serve someone else. It's, it seeks to lay down your life for someone else. Agape love is, is the love of Jesus Christ. It's all about loving someone more than you love yourself. It's not self-serving love. So our world doesn't really, because our world doesn't understand love, it, it's somewhat confused, and then it throws it all into one category, which is very confusing. Now, what they talk about on Valentine's Day, they don't know what they're talking about on Valentine's Day. Just go, go down the aisle of places that, that sell Valentine's Day cards, and you'll see how confused everybody is. I mean, on one hand, it's Eros, and then it's not, or whatever. But the point is, is that no matter how high and romantic and euphoric your feelings may be for another person, no matter how much you're convinced that you are madly in love with somebody else, that feeling, that high state, I don't care how much in love you are, for different people, they don't feel that. For many people, they feel it, but they feel it for varying lengths of time. And some people can have this madly in love thing going on for like a year or more. Some people, it's weeks or months or a half year. So there's, there's, no, there's not some you know, one-size-fits-all formula to it. And so there used to be a time when we lived in a Christian culture where people endeavored to, I don't know how successful they were, but I would imagine a lot of people were successful. They waited uh, uh, until they were married before they engaged in physical intimacy. And so many people were virgins before their marriage because they wanted to consecrate their body to God and the other person. Now, that is. Uh, uh, somewhat proportionally less in today's society. But the point is, you, you, quote, fall in love with someone, and if that's the basis of your marriage, what happens is, life happens, that's what's happened. Stuff happens, life happens, stuff happens, problems happen that, that you have to deal with. Job problems, money problems, health problems. We all know problems. We all have to deal with them. We all have to handle problems. And when those problems start to happen in accumulation, that puts pressure on people and pressure on relationships. And guess what happens? People who are like walking around high as a kite emotionally, euphorically, madly in love, when all these problems start to happen, like somebody loses their job or you can't make your payment on your rent or your whatever, money problems, this problem, that problem, when all these problems accumulate, it changes your biochemistry and you lose that euphoric, romantic feeling. And th then you have people enduring that, thinking, well, I, falsely thinking, I must have married the wrong per person because I don't feel in love, or we fell out of love. Well, no, you didn't fall out of love because you didn't fall into love to begin with. And this is, this is where every person 
needs to go through some kind of transformational process which involves their will. And if you're a Christian, you have the advantage of the Holy Spirit that your marriage isn't based on just how high your human love is in terms of falling in love, because that will be tested. It always is tested. And then people don't feel this euphoria because, you know, life can be challenging and they think that they fell out of love. No, they didn't fall out of love. Here, when you c- come to that place, and you will, and don't, don't get mad at me and say I'm a downer, I'm just telling you the truth. You will come to a crossroads where you'll have an opportunity for the Lord to mature your love in the sense that when you invite Christ to fill you with his supernatural love for the other person, the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. God is love. Okay, it's great that you had eros, romantic love, and it was in such a high state. Now you're encountering challenges. What, the only foundation that's strong enough for, for, for what you can build your life or a marriage or a family upon, there's only one thing strong enough to hold together a marriage or a family or whatever, and that is the foundation of the agape love of Jesus Christ. And how you get the agape love of Jesus Christ is that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And the fruit of his spirit is love, agape love. And so what happens if you will allow yourself, if you will allow the Lord to transform you, what will happen is that you will regain new and fresh love for your marriage partner because you'll be drawing on the wellsprings of God's agape love, which is a fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, etc., etc. And that adds a new and added dimension to the love you have for your mate or whatever. Because now you're operating on the love of God, not just human love, which is very fickle. Now, that doesn't mean romantic love cannot coexist with the love of God. That doesn't mean romantic love goes out the window forever. It simply means that romantic love is not your foundation. You can still have romantic love. You can still have eros in a marriage. You should have that. But you should, more importantly, have agape love. Because it's agape love that's going to carry you through the ups and downs. And so when people say to me, well, we fell out of love, you know... You're kind and you're nice and stuff, but what you're really saying to yourself and you try to communicate to them is that, yeah, this is an opportunity for you to learn about how to draw upon the agape love of Jesus Christ, to have the Spirit of God, which is love in your heart. And so you love your mate, or you love people that you emotionally would not normally like. You love them, but you don't love them with your human love, which is filial of love. Because, look, part of having a sinful human nature is that we're all fickle. As human beings, some people's personalities turn you off. Some people get on your nerves in a big way. And you don't even know the reason why. You can be in some place. You can be in a church. You can be anywhere. And, and you can suddenly not like somebody for no good reason. You just That person bugs you. Or you just like that person and you don't know why. Well, the reason is, is that you're, again, basing your love on a false foundation. You're trying to love someone from, your own, from the wellspring of your own fallen human nature. And there's, there's nothing in that bank account to draw upon that will provide love for somebody that you don't love in your human state of consciousness. That's where, you know, when the Bible says love one another, the Bible's talking about Christians. We're supposed to love one another as Christ loved the church. That is an impossible command by Jesus Christ. If you try to do that with your human strength, you will just crash and burn because you don't have enough love in you to love everybody who walks through the door because you're fickle like I am, like we all are. 
So we ask to be filled with God's love. And the more time we spend in his word, renewing our minds, the more time we times we pray, the more times we ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit, the more the Spirit of God bears fruit in our life. And one of the important fruits of the Holy Spirit is love. Then we love the person that our human part of us doesn't like. All of a sudden, we like them because we're walking in the Lord. We can, lo- we can like a mate and forgive a mate. You can be married, and it doesn't take long for there to, to come about an accumulation of grudges, resentments, unforgivenesses, bad English, I know. Uh, all kinds of stuff about your mate can come up as time goes by. And what happens is a lot of people stuff that into their subconscious or sweep it under the carpet. Could be constant resentment of, of re- regarding any kind of thing regarding your mate. And you let it build up and you let it build up and you let it build up and you don't take it to the Lord or you don't deal with it. And then something dumb ignites it. Boom! You explode in anger or you run out the door and you threaten to divorce or maybe you intend to divorce. Who knows? Why? 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 Because you were trying to build your relationship on human love and human love just doesn't cut it. So we don't fall in and out of love. And we need to teach ourselves that and need to teach our children that. We're not negating the legitimate experience of, in its proper context and in its proper place, eros or romantic love. And remember, eros can mean physical intimacy, but it can also be simply that emotional, euphoric high of being in love. In either case, and sometimes it's both together. And God has a plan for that. It's called marriage. And that's to protect it. And when you're married, if you, if you, your marriage, this sounds corny. I apologize for it sounding corny, but I can't think of a more truthful and and better illustration. A marriage is like a garden. It really is. If you tend to the garden and you plant the right seeds and you water the garden, and you take care of it, the garden will bear fruit or flowers or whatever and green leaves. And it's a place of replenishment and healing. And it's a, a garden that's taken care of well is, is a place of refreshing and healing. Marriage can be like that, but it requires work. If you're going to not water the lawn in California, you're going to have one. You know what it looks like in California? You know what it looks like. It, it looks like a bunch of brown, burnt camel hair, brown blankets. They're hideous looking. And that can happen right now with the heat in California. You stop watering your lawn for four days. By the fifth day, you're risking your entire lawn going brown. Just burn up. Just That's just like five days of neglect. But if you tend to the garden, and, and a lawn is part of the garden, you, you water it. Same with marriage. You have to nurture each other. You have to forgive each other. You have to build each other up. And guess what happens? When you do that, it's not magic. When you do that, all of a sudden, the feeling of, oh, I'm falling in love happens again. It may be just like it was when you were met each other in your 20s or whatever. Oftentimes, if you've been married a longer period of time, people will get, have the, the mistake about marriage over a long period of time. It doesn't. It doesn't. It can be incredibly romantic and in love, but you know what? It's people will tell you it's better. It's deeper. It's richer. Now, I'm not a, a drinker, and I'm, I'm not somebody who's a you know super legalist either. But people tell me, and they wouldn't have to tell me because you know. I used to drink like a fish for crying out loud, but that was a long time ago. It's like fine wine. You know, cheap wine tastes, tastes it. I'm not a big on wine tasting because I don't drink, but fine wine that's aged properly has a deep, rich flavor. And so a marriage where um, you've been through ups and downs can have a, dip, a deep, rich love that is far more 
euphoric in in the long term than you know the the, the, the flash of experience momentary experience so we don't fall out of love we don't fall into love we're we're participants in it and we have a very important role to play and this is the role by the way that was given to adam and eve by god god was pretty basic wasn't he he put adam and eve in in paradise called the garden of eden and they were responsible to tend or take care of the garden the garden of their life or lives and by doing some few things that they had to do i don't know exactly what they had to do uh, the garden flourished and they lived in paradise and their relationship flourished and they lived in paradise so god you know wanted to make a very simple com- uh, communication if you tend your garden your garden will will be a blessing to you if you if you don't tend to your garden your, your garden will become a curse for you all life is like that not just marriage but all of life and that includes being a single person who's a christian it includes your spiritual life it includes your parenting life it inc- includes your working life the same principles that adam and eve used to tend the garden those principles are applicable in all areas of life and if you listen to what the holy spirit is saying through his word and you tend to the garden of your life you produce an atmosphere of fruitfulness and abundance and joy and healing in all of life it's kind of simple so freedom of speech ownership of the media is an essential part of this and when someone doesn't have a knowledge of the bible that's deep enough to be able to teach you the important connection and the all important relationship let's say for example between their personal walk with god the role of the church the role of the individual christian and how that directly connects to everything we're saying regarding society and culture and the mainstream media if if the person that's teaching you the bible does not have the depth of knowledge of the scripture to be able to make a direct connection between what your spirit is being fed in the media and what the fallout of that will be then you're going to the wrong church no wonder your crops are are drying up and when i say crops i'm talking about your life if you're looking at your life and and your your life there's an absence of, of fruit in your life everything is drying up and becoming barren well maybe it's time for you to ask where are you being fed spiritually where are you what kind of uh, nutrition are you being exposed to spiritually if you never hear somebody teach you for example on the direct connection between the media and what the media is putting into your mind heart soul and spirit and the importance of that and your walk with Christ then you have made a fatally wrong decision and and don't blame god if your life seems cursed don't blame god if there's no fruit in your life and your life seems cursed don't you dare blame him don't blame god when you made the choice you see it's like marrying somebody for the wrong reason. Let's talk about looks. Looks are important to a lot of people. Looks are important. Women generally speaking want an attractive husband, but that that's like the different definition for different people. Women want a, a, a wife who's attractive to them. People don't necessarily want a movie star or a model. They want somebody who's attractive to them. And that 
is, is a relative thing. But if your entire decision of whether or not to marry someone is based exclusively on their physical appearance and nothing else, in other words, your measurement of whether or not you're going to be in love or marry this individual is solely based on their physical appearance and how beautiful or handsome or pretty or whatever you think she or he is, then you are making a huge mistake. And you're not making one of the most important decisions in your life using wisdom. There's absolutely nothing wrong in desiring a mate that is attractive to you. Because attractive is different for different people. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong in you desiring an attractive mate, male or female. But wisdom would dictate that there are other things that are very important, such as the character of that person. So let's say your your all-consuming desire is to have a a beautiful or good-looking or attractive or a handsome uh, mate. Okay, and you neglected the character issue. So you end up marrying an attractive mate, but their character is corrupted and they can't be trusted and they lie and they are compulsive liars. And because their character is corrupted because you didn't bother to prioritize it, they cheat on you. They commit adultery. Now your life is hell. You could have avoided that mistake. You could have avoided the nightmare of the divorce and all the pain and suffering that went along with it if you had bothered to seek the Lord and analyzed your prospective mate, not just based upon their physical characteristics, but other very important characteristics such as their character. What kind of person are they really underneath the looks? Because not everybody that's pretty and handsome are pretty and handsome inside themselves. You know, you know that. Do they have wisdom? Are they long-suffering? There's so many other things to consider. So don't blame God if your marriage goes bad because you didn't think it was important The only thing that you cared about was their looks or how much money they had. There's nothing wrong with wanting a partner who can help provide uh, a good living for you. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if that's your only method of measurement, and then the person turns out to be the most selfish person there is, it's not going to work. So you need to have the wisdom of God. So this same wisdom of tending the garden needs to be applied to all of life. And that includes the nation we live in, the society we live in, the culture we live in. And how does one become wise? Because you see, when you have wisdom, all this stuff falls into place. When you lack wisdom, you're a walking target. You're a sucker for destruction. So what you really need is like life wisdom. That's what you need. You need life wisdom. And so where are you going to get life wisdom? By watching the view every day? Do you really think watching the view every day is going to give you life wisdom? Are you kidding me? Watching the view is going to give you life wisdom? Um, If you think watching the view is going to give uh, life wisdom, I could just say, you know, may the Lord have mercy on your soul, because that's not where you're going to find it. If you want to be wise, you got to hang around wise people. If you want to be wise, which God commands us in his word to become wise, you need to go to sources where wisdom is available. And that means you avoid sources where um, stupidity is being sold as if it was wisdom. 
You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. We'll be back in just a moment. We have upcoming Paradise Mountain Church meetings. We have new videos. We have the brand new book you can pre-order. And we have a Paradise uh, Mountain Church meeting September, excuse me, August 28th, Thursday. Mark it on your calendar. The directions are at paulmcguire.us. That's August 28th, Thursday, and then September 26th, Thursday. September 26th, Thursday, and August 29th, Thursday. I hope I said 29th. Paradise Mountain Church. But you go to paulmcguire.us. There's directions. You have to pre-register. It's free. But a map and all that stuff is available for you there. Visit paulmcguire.us. And we'll be back in just a second. This is Paul McGuire. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. So falling in love, falling out of love. If we really understand what love is, you can't fall in love, you can't fall out of love. Unless you're basing your definition of love on a very popular illusion. And that popular illusion is what is called eros, or erotic love, or romantic uh, love that involves physical intimacy. And that is not really love. It's a human experience, but it's not true love. True love is agape love. It's spiritual love. And it's only when you build your life or marriage or whatever, a society, to the degree that you can build it in an agape love, um, even in a secular environment, you, you shape the reality that you're living in, and you create a foundation that's strong enough to withstand the test of time, because adversity, difficulty, and challenges come into everybody's life. So, how do you acquire that love? Well, one of the primary ways you acquire that love is you study and read the Word of God. You feed off the Word of God. Because the Word of God teaches us it's the only source it's the only spiritual source of any spiritual book that will teach you about authentic spiritual love or agape love if you're trying to 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 get an idea of what true love is about from a secular media which has no clue whatsoever your life will be a wreck It'll be a total wreck. Nothing will work. So feeding off television shows and episodic TV shows and comedy shows and romantic comedies, etc., um, they're not going to instill in you the reality of what true love is. True love is found in God's Word. True love is found in God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God imparts into us as individuals Agape love. That's why love is a fruit of the Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, the pure Holy Spirit living inside you, you can't produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love. So let's just take a marriage relationship. We could take any relationship. How on earth could you possibly expect a marriage relationship to work and flourish and prosper if the marriage relationship is built on anything less than agape love, it won't flourish. It will flourish kind of like an illusion for a season, and then all hell will break loose. That's why the divorce courts are packed. Divorce lawyers are not going out of business. I don't know what the latest data is, but let's say it's approximately 50% of all marriages end in divorce. And I'm sure it's more specific than that. Well, if half of all marriages or more end in divorce, then your odds going into a marriage are like flipping a coin. I was talking with my wife, Chris, the other day. We've been married for something like 44 years. We are more in love today than we were then. And I use the word in love, which is not a precise definition. Why is that? 
The early days of our marriage, by the way, I say this at conferences all the time, people laugh, and I'm really not saying it to be humorous. <laughs> I'm simply telling you the truth. The early days of our marriage were like Vietnam. It was all out war between her and me, or me and her, because I didn't have a clue how to be a husband, and she didn't have a clue how to be a wife. And most of you don't have a clue how to be a husband or wife either. Because most people don't come from homes anymore where there was any real modeling of what it meant to be a husband or a wife. And I remember um, hearing about this Christian psychologist. They had Christian psychologists got together and promoted this survey that they wanted people to take. And um, on the basis of this survey, they believe, the Christian psychologists, that they could accurately predict whether your marriage would end in divorce or it would succeed based on if both of you would agree to take the survey. They felt that it would be very accurate and helpful in marriage counseling. Now, I'm not suggesting that it wasn't helpful or uh, uh, it wasn't a, a useful tool in marriage counseling. but. After we, we heard about this uh, the psychological test that you could take to determine if your marriage would succeed or fail, um, after about 20 years of marriage, we heard about this psychological test. So I took it and she took it. And guess what it told us? It told us that our divorce was basically guaranteed to end up in divorce. Okay, this is, this is the, 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 the thinking and the research of Christian psychological experts on marriage. And we were so psychologically non-suited to have a successful marriage that had we, had, had we not been married for 20 years when we read the test, most likely a pastor who was relying on uh, this test would have suggested that we get serious marriage counseling and not get, get married. So, since the time of that test, which basically said, Mr. and Mrs. McGuire, you are guaranteed to get a divorce, we've been now married for about a total of approximately 44 years. Defied all the odds, Many of our friends are divorced. Oh, yeah, don't get me wrong. There were a lot of things in that marriage uh, survey that were true. So I'm not against the marriage survey, per se. Uh, it's just there was, there's one word that they didn't fully calculate into their marriage survey. And I'd like to sh share with you what it is and what it was. You see, because based on the scientific statistics that these Christian professional psychologists put together, we should have been divorced many times over. So why are we still married after 44 years? One word. Jesus. Jesus. The only reason Paul and Christina McGuire are married today is because of Jesus, period. It's not because of some inner nobility on my part or inner nobility on her part. It's not because of anything. I'm not against marriage counseling. I'm not against counseling as long as it's biblical. But what saved our marriage was Jesus. That's why we're married today, and we're happily married. Happily married doesn't mean we don't have problems, but we're, ha we're more than happily married. I feel like I'm on my second honeymoon, for crying out loud. No, I'm, I'm serious. After 44 years of marriage, I feel like I'm on my second honeymoon. Except it's better this time, because my, my priorities, my, my, my outlook on life is more mature. And you see, I have this blessing, and she has this blessing, that is so awesome 
that I have somebody to talk to about my life, about life experiences, who's actually been there and shared with me all of these life experiences and vice versa with her. Who was there in the ups and the downs and everything else. And that is a wonderful, beautiful thing. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. But none of it would have been possible without Jesus. Now, you might ask the question, well, there's lots of Christians, maybe yourself, you know, you, you had Jesus, you knew Jesus. You did everything you could to make it work, and it didn't work. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not, any, I'm not better than anyone, okay? I understand that, okay? I can't tell you why. But I do know this. Our marriage was so bad. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about bad. That it forced us to cry out to God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And we had to cry out to God constantly. And so over the years, God used that to shift and shape and work on our personalities and grow us. And so because of Jesus, we're still married. Now, there's no legalistic pride in that. If you've been married more than once, if you've been married twice, if you've been married whatever number of times you've been married, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to shame you. I'm not here to say I'm better than you are because I'm not better than you are. I'm simply saying that no matter what marriage this is for you, or if you're single or whatever, the hope is Jesus. Now, we live in a fallen world. And when I write a book, like I have now, called The Grace Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, it's not just talking about certain spiritual battles. It also includes the spiritual battle at the core of people's lives, the, the, the battle for marriage. Okay. The battle for um, the viability of, 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 of a relationship as God intended it to be. But we live in a fallen world. And because we live in the fallen world, the spiritual battle is raging all around us. So this is one of the major premises of my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, which you can pre order now at paulmcguire.us. The basic premises, premise is. There's a spiritual battle raging unlike any other battle we've experienced before. And this impacts everything. It impacts marriages. It impacts children. It impacts child raising. It impacts all kinds of things. So the, the stressors, the tensions, the obstacles are way, way beyond what they used to be. So I am not putting myself in a position of judge or criticizing people. It's, it's a spiritual war zone out there. I understand that. So please, whatever you hear out of this program, the Paul McGuire Report, I don't want anyone walking away from listening to, today, to today's program feeling un, under condemnation, feeling that they failed God, feeling that they that they feeling any sense of shame, feeling that they haven't measured up. Okay, I don't want anyone to walk away from the program, feeling that way, because that would be to miss the point. Remember, in addition to the word Jesus, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us of all sin, past, present, and future. We all have different personality structures. We all have different backgrounds. This is a very dicey thing to say, and I'm not avoiding the truthfulness of the Bible. But you see, each one of us had a different childhood. Each one of us had different inputs, different experiences in our life. And all of this together adds up to how we make decisions, why we make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So Paul McGuire is not necessarily spiritually superior because he's still married and uh, some of you are not. But that's not how it works. You had a different life experience than I had. You had a different childhood than I had. Different things uh, went into the cake mix, so to speak. So I don't want anyone to feel condemned. The key is to 
put your heart and soul in the direction of God and cry out to God, and you do the best you can, and you cry out to God to make up the difference. That's, that's the key. The key is that you're not resisting God. The key is that you may be imperfect about it, but your intention is to follow God. You're, you, you, you may not be 100%, but your intention is to follow God. That's the person that the blessing of the Lord is upon their life. It's not upon the perfect person, because if it was, none of us would qualify. God's blessing is upon the person whose intention, the intention of their heart is to follow God, listen to God, and obey God. You will be blessed. You will walk under the blessing of God if that's your intention. Perfection is not the prerequisite. So I hope nobody goes away feeling condemned. We're all, let me remind you of what you already know. We're all sinners saved by grace. Some of us sin in different areas. That doesn't mean one of us is better than the other. And in addition to that, you know, some people get proud because they don't commit this kind of sin. They only commit that kind of sin. Well, in God's eyes, sin is sin. So that's why we don't look down upon people, because each of us have different kinds of weaknesses. So it's not a matter of pride. We're all created differently. The key is that we ask God for forgiveness of sin. The key is that we believe that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. The key is that we, by faith, come boldly to the throne of grace to find an ever-present help in time of need. That is the central issue in spiritual warfare, by the way. The central issue in spiritual warfare, besides whether or not you choose to be saved by faith in Christ, the central issue in spiritual warfare can be found in the book of Revelation chapter 12. And I want to read you some verses from Revelation chapter 12 which will zoom in on the central issue in spiritual warfare. And when you understand this, when the Lord gives you a revelation of the truth in in these verses, it will change everything for you forever. It'll, It'll keep you, it'll deliver you from the treadmill and set you onto the path of freedom. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Pass this program on far and wide. Send the link of this program to somebody who needs it, to somebody who can be helped by it. Help us do an end run around the censors by going to paulmcguire.us or sending this program via the link that you're listening or watching to it, watching it now on. One of the things that I tried to explain in the brand new book I'm finishing, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. I talk about the raging spiritual battle that we're all in, and it's part of an end times prophetic battle. But I not only talk about the major reasons why we're in this spiritual battle, but I teach in the book what I believe God wants to communicate with his people about his supernatural power and his supernatural wisdom, that if we would heed his supernatural power and wisdom, each one of us could be victorious in this spiritual battle. Because I believe it's a winnable war. And when it comes to spiritual intercession, uh, intercessory prayer warfare, when it comes uh, into the area of your own personal spiritual warfare regarding your own life, there's a central principle that I want to share from share with you from the book of Revelation. It's interesting that God put this in the book of Revelation, and it's from Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to share it with you. And I believe that as the Holy Spirit of God opens this up to you, and you get not just a, a mental, intellectual understanding of what God is saying, but God supernaturally opens up opens it up to you. You will be set free, um, and you will have a revelation from the Word of God that will cause you to be victorious in ways that you never thought were possible before.
And in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, I want to read you some verses. I believe that these verses will change your life forever when you understand the verses. So in Revelation chapter 12, we read, starting in verse 7, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now I have come, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Okay, so let's explain what the Lord is saying in Revelation chapter 12. First of all, there's a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the th- authority of his Christ. So the, the, the first thing God is saying is that salvation, power, and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ has come because Jesus Christ is Lord. And then it talks about the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren is Lucifer or Satan. One of the, the, the one of the most primary spiritual strategies of the devil, of Satan, of Lucifer, of the accuser of the brethren, one of the most primary spiritual attacks the devil uses against every believer is in the area of accusation. And what he does is, first of all, he accuses us of sins and failings before God, before the actual throne room of God. For the accuser of our brothers, or brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. So Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's you and me. Satan is the accuser of all believers. But let us remember something. There are a number of important truths to understand regarding this. First of all, it is usually Satan who tempts us to sin to begin with. So what he does is first he tempts us, and then he traps us and blames us and accuses us for sinning, when many times he was involved in getting us or enticing us to to sin to begin with. But the reason this is his favorite game, his favorite strategy against believers, it's because as long as believers in Jesus Christ don't have a revelation as to what Jesus Christ has done, Satan still has an open door to come after and go after you again and again and again and again and paralyze you and destroy your entire life until you learn the revelation of the truth in God's word. For the accuser of our brethren, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They, that's believers in Jesus Christ, overcame him, who? Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. 
Okay, so how did they overcome Satan making accusations about them day and night before the throne room of God? And then let's bring it on home to our own personal lives. Every time we sin, whether we're aware of it or not, we violate the law of God. And technically, we could be accused of having sinned because in many cases we have sinned. And so Satan, his weapon, his favorite weapon of warfare is to entice us to sin. And then he carefully records what sins we've committed. And then he brings them up before the Lord and accuses us, hoping that God will punish us or God will, do, will stop blessing us or God will stop answering our prayers because, after all, we're guilty of such and such. Now, this is where the Holy Spirit needs to give you a revelation. It may be true that you are guilty of this or guilty of that. It may be true that you, you've committed sins that, that should cause you to be punished by God. That may be true. But it also may be true that Satan, or the accuser of our, our brethren, is greatly exaggerating, which means he's lying about our sins, or he's making them up to begin with. In other words, you didn't, you didn't really sin. Or he's exaggerating to the extent which you have sinned. Because remember, Satan is the father of lies. He has, he's not a credible testimony because his track record is lies. So he may be coming before the throne room of God, and his goal is to get you to feel so bad about yourself, so ashamed of yourself, that you wouldn't dare pray to God. You wouldn't dare expect to be used by God. You, you, you shirk away from praying for God's miraculous intervention because it always comes down to you don't feel worthy enough. You feel secretly inside an inner, inner sense of shame, which prevents you from being victorious, which prevents you from being an overcomer in the great spiritual battle, which is what the intention of Satan is. So he tempts you, you yield to the temptation, and then he accuses you before God. Because it's, his attack against you is all based on lies. He wants you to believe the lie that God has rejected you. But God has not rejected you. But Satan is accusing you because he wants you to believe the lie that God has rejected you that God is finished with you. So how do you overcome the accuser of the brethren? It says in Revelation 12, they, that means believers in Christ, for they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Which simply means, when you understand in your heart through the revelation of the Holy Spirit that no matter what sin you have committed, in the past, in the present, or in the future, if you come to God with that sin or sins and ask God to forgive you of those sins and to wash you clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, God promises that no matter what you've done in terms of your sin or sins, if you ask God to forgive you of those sins, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of all sin God chooses to no longer remember your sins. God now sees you because you've been cleansed of your sins by the blood of Jesus. So God now sees you as totally pure and holy. He doesn't even see the sin anymore. He sees you totally pure and holy because you have taken advantage of, by faith, his free offer of forgiveness of sins and cleansing of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, even if you are guilty and you did sin, or even if Satan is lying and exaggerating or making it up, the, the bottom line is you can no longer be shamed. You can no longer be punished. You can no longer be exiled by God for your sin or sins because those sins don't really exist anymore 
There's nothing between you and God because all of your sins have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus if you've repented of them and you've been forgiven by Jesus if you ask Christ to forgive you. You're totally cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, when Jesus Christ or God sees you, he sees you as totally pure and holy. Therefore, all the accusations of the evil one don't amount to a hill of beans. They're hollow accusations. They don't have any staying power. They don't have any holding power because you've been set free of those sins. Even if you're in the process of still, still struggling to overcome them, you've been set free. Now, God may set you free from sins. God may forgive you of all sin, which he does. But you may have to work out the consequences. That doesn't mean God hasn't forgiven you. It doesn't mean God is still punishing you. But sometimes we mess things up in such a way that it takes time for the Lord and ourselves to to undo the mess that we've created for ourselves, which could last years. That doesn't mean we're condemned, though. It doesn't mean that we're not forgiven. It just means that there's a penalty to sin, the spiritual penalty Jesus Christ paid for. But sometimes we have to work out the practicalities of what we caused with our our sins. But the point is, we are victory over Satan, who's the accuser of the brethren. We're no longer trapped under the lie that God won't answer our prayers or God can't use us anymore. We we have been free. We have been declared free in the highest courtroom of the land. And so none of us should feel shame or guilt and condemnation over any sin in the past, no matter what it was. If we have asked God to forgive us, God has forgiven us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that means we're cleansed by the blood of that sin. And Christ does not even see that sin. Now, that is powerful, and that is why Christianity, among all the other religions in the world, is totally unique. All the other religions preach this nonsense about how you have to go through a thousand reincarnations of a turtle, a frog, a donkey, a porcupine, a pig, over and over again until you finally work out your karma through, through the law of reincarnation. What nonsense. That's total bondage. Or, you know, you have to chant Om for 27 years up on a mountaintop and think nothing but the word Om before you can be liberated or free from the the wheel of births and deaths, according to some Eastern mystical teaching. All nonsense. All you need to do is know what the Word of God says. And what does the Word of God say? What does the Word of God say? It says, God's Word says, that the penalty of all sin is death. And without the spilling of blood, there is no remission of sins. But we have an advocate, an attorney, who has died on the cross on our behalf. Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sins, past, present, and future, when he died on a cross for us. And then, if we ask him to, he will cleanse us of all of our sin by his blood and we will be totally cleansed of sin. Therefore, the enemy, Satan, the evil one, can no longer function as the accuser of the brethren because there's nothing for him to accuse us of because God erased it all with his blood. That's why the gospel is called the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the great news of Jesus Christ. It's good news because it means you're not perpetually paying for the same sin over and over again. And no matter how, no matter how, how, how much you've really messed up, there's still hope for you. That's the point. You're free. You're not in a jail cell. And so no matter how much you messed up, you are free. And you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. God can still use you. And because of that truth, when you own that truth, when you believe that truth, Then, it's at that moment, it says, they overcame him, who? Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Well, what's the blood of the Lamb? Christ's blood has cleansed you from all sin. The word of your testimony is is that you have been forgiven of all of your sins because you've asked Christ to forgive you of all your sins. 
No matter what you've done, you have a clean start. No more shame. No more beating yourself up. No more condemnation. Christ has forgiven you. That is liberating. And I want you to listen carefully to what I'm saying. No matter what lifestyle you are involved in, no matter what sins you've committed, don't allow the devil to to hit the replay button and play back for you over and over again all the sinful things you did and then beat you up and tell you how what a pig you are and how you know you're worthless and all that stuff you don't have to listen to the devil and his accusations that tape that the devil keeps playing has been erased by God. There's really nothing on the tape. The devil is just convincing you that there's a recording of all your actions. Now, I can hear somebody say, well, the Bible says in that when we appear through at, uh, at the great white throne of judgment, God's going to open the book of life, and it's, we're, we're gonna, God's going to examine everything we've done in our life. And, and people have the idea that, you know, there's going to be some kind of instant replay button at the Great White Throne of Judgment, and God's going to play a highlight reel of all your sins and tell you why you can't get into heaven. Well, here's the all-important thing to know about that. Only certain kinds of people are going to go to the Great White Throne of Judgment. If you have asked Jesus to cleanse you of all your sins, then all your sins have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Your name is written in the book of life, and you're guaranteed entrance into heaven. Therefore, because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and because all of your sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus, there's nothing for anybody to watch on your sin replay reel. It's all been erased by the blood of Jesus. And number two is, if you have received Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior and you're born again, you will never stand before the great white throne of judgment because you're guaranteed entrance into heaven and all your sins are forgiven. Those people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and are born again, their names are written in the book of life. No one, no one who is truly born again no one whose name is written in the book of life, no one who has put their faith in Christ and has had all their sins forgiven, no one like that will stand before the great white throne of judgment because God views you as sinless. You'll stand before an entirely different place called uh, the judgment seat of Christ where the issue is not your salvation, the issue is rewards for, for service well done. The only people who stand before the great white throne of judgment where a review is played before them of all their sins are those people who have rejected God's free offer of salvation. Their name isn't written in the book of life, and because they've rejected God's free offer of salvation, God will review with them on their replay tape, if you want to use those words, all the the sins they've committed. And then they're sentenced to, sentenced to the lake of fire for all eternity. But that's not, that's not your destiny. You've been set for, free with Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you of all sin. In the past, in the present, and in the future. So you should have the supernatural joy of God. Because you have been set free. Salvation is priceless. But Christ paid the price for you. I really hope you can rejoice in that and receive that. And I want to encourage you to help us spread this message about God's saving uh, message through faith in Christ. Help us win souls for Jesus Christ. And one of the ways you can do that is to order the brand new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. If you pre-order it now at paulmcguire.us, you will get your copy rushed to you as soon as it's printed before it's released to the general public. Also, if you pre-order it now, you'll receive a financial discount on the book. And if you pre-order it now, you'll receive an autographed copy of the book. And why not pre-order multiple copies and have them sent to people who need to hear its message? And finally, we're able to present this message to you 
of the truth of God's word, which will set you free, because we have people like you who have chosen to be spiritual intercessory prayer warriors for me, the ministry, and my family. Thank you for your prayers. We need more of you to ask God about whether or not you should pray. And if God tells you to pray, then accept your assignment and pray. Become an intercessory prayer warrior. We thank God for those of you who help spread the message far and wide so we can get around internet censorship. That's right. It's horrible, but the internet censorship is such that there are computers that are designed to block the free spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you take it upon yourself to send these messages and things like that independently, you do an end run around the censorship engines. And finally, we need all of you who, who give, who've gone to the Lord in, in simple prayer and said, Lord Jesus, how much do you want me to give Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church? And you waited till the Lord spoke to you in your heart, and you obeyed, obeyed God. No matter what God told you to do, no matter how big, no, no matter how out of the box, whatever God told you to do, you simply obeyed him. And we thank God for each one of you that have done that and have made a financial contribution and donation to this ministry. And then we thank God for all those of you that the Lord spoke. And God simply said, I want you to give this amount faithfully every month. Well, guess what? Those smaller gifts, faithfully given every month, add up to a lot when you're adding it up for many people. So never, never falsely assume that your gift, no matter whether it's large or small, is not important. Because if there's a lot of people giving faithfully a small amount, it adds up, as well as those people that God has blessed to give a large amount. That's how we can continue ministering to you and expanding our outreach. So God bless you. Visit paulmcguire.us. Help us spread the word. And remember, there's no shame that you should be carrying. No guilt. The voice of the accuser of the brethren should be silenced in your life. And let's say you're in the struggle. You're in a struggle, as so many people are, against sin. Well, guess what? The very fact that you're struggling against sin means that you're spiritually alive. If you had given yourself over to sin, you wouldn't feel guilty about it. You wouldn't be struggling against it. I'm not telling you to go out and sin, but I'm telling you the very fact that you're struggling against sin is proof that the Holy Spirit is at work in you. Because people who are struggling against sin are people who deep inside don't love sin. They love God. So don't allow the devil to, to, to you know, put false shame on you. When you repent and you ask for the power to overcome sin, you are pleasing the Lord. And you keep walking in that faith and that trust and that obedience, and God will break the power of that sin over your life. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. 